let's get started. So um, let me welcome all of the attendees uh, from Asia, Africa, Europe, the Americas. Uh, we're very happy to have you here for this primer on cross-border insolvency. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Ishan Madan, has managed to uh, secure for us one of the world's most renowned experts on cross-border insolvency, Dr. Francisco Reyes Villamizar. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ishan so he can introduce uh, Dr. Reyes Villamizar and uh, get the show on the road. Thank you, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to CILS and Arbinsol's webinar, a primer on cross-border insolvency. Our discussion today is timely, given how the pandemic's destructive path has been unsparing on global trade and financial liquidity. Being pushed to cope with the pandemic, the resilience of businesses and economies is being tested like never before. The breaks in business continuity, changes in revenues, are hammered and workforce productivity, to say a few, have been exposed to business, have exposed businesses to financial difficulties with the looming risk of insolvency or bankruptcy. With the assets spread out in multiple jurisdictions, the reorganization of the same can only be done through domestic or cross-border insolvency laws. Cross-border insolvency is not a new concept, but given the sparse adoption of uniform principles, it is still an emerging field. The purpose of cross-border insolvency is to provide legal certainty to better organization of such assets, protecting the interests of creditors and stakeholders, and maximization of value of assets. But how is cross-border insolvency different from domestic insolvency? What is the need? How does it function? What are the challenges involved? How does the ancestral model law help? Among the nations that have adopted the ancestral model law, how different are the approaches? We have a very, very special speaker today, Professor Dr. Francisco Reyes Villamizar. He's a former chairman of the UNCITRAL, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, and a former superintendent of companies in Colombia. Dr. Villamizar has been an active participant and draftsman of several comprehensive legislative reforms to the Colombian laws of corporations and bankruptcy, including the successful law of simplified stock corporations enacted in 2008. He has, part, he has prepared several model laws and presided over several governmental commissions for amendments to laws. With degrees from Bogota, University of Miami School of Law, a PhD in law from the University of Tilburg, he also holds a diploma in Portuguese culture from the University of Lisbon. Dr. Ries Viamizar has been a visiting professor across North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. He has also authored several books and articles in the field of business associations and bankruptcy. He's an active member of the Academy of Comparative Law, the International Academy of Commercial and Consumer Law, and the Colombian Academy of Jurisprudence. Dr. Viamizar has also participated in various ancestral working groups. A master of many trades, he is also, quite literally, a rock star who had a famous rock band. He's done various concerts in various stadia across the world, and he continues to follow his passion for creating music. Attendees are requested now to keep sending in their questions using the question answer tab on your chat and to participate in the polls as we go along. We'll try to cover and address all questions towards the end of the presentation. Now, without former ado, I invite Dr. Via Mitza to take center stage and give us a, a ride through cross-border insolvency. Thank you so much, Isham, and good morning in the Americas. Good afternoon in Europe and, and Africa. Good evening in Asia. It's really a great opportunity for me to address this fantastic international audience. And I would like to congratulate and thank especially uh, Isham and Chris for putting together this wonderful event and also for this fantastic initiative of creating Arvin Sol, which is going to be a very successful academic and, pro and professional initiative. What I'm going to do, and I think this, this um, seminar has been properly named a primer on cross-border insolvency, is just to give you the basic tenets and the basic ideas concerning what cross-border insolvency is like. 
for that purpose, I have uh, prepared a presentation that includes some of the basic principles of um, cross-border insolvency. Also talk a little bit about Oncitrol. What is Oncitrol? What is its mandate? What does it do uh, in trying to harmonize uh, international, uh, internationally commercial laws? And also talk about some few cases in which I have had the opportunity to participate uh, e either as an attorney or as a governmental officer that involve cross-border insolvency. Without any further to say, uh, let's move on to talk about Oncitrol. Let's talk about this very important commission of the United Nations. It was created in 1966, so it's been around for more than 50 years, more than half a century of activities. It has 60 members, 60 active members that actually meet uh, several times during the year, either in Vienna, which is uh, basically the headquarters of Oncitral, or in New York. And these 60 members are divided into different regional uh, origins, including first 14 African states, 14 states from Asia, eight Eastern European countries, 10 countries from Latin America and the Caribbean, and 14 uh, countries that come from different regions in the world that have been put together, including Western European countries, Canada, the US, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, Oncitral has working groups. These working groups, what they do basically is they meet twice a year and they develop the different products, uh, the different legislative and non-legislative instruments that Oncitral uh, prepares. Working groups have uh, changed frequently, but normally they have uh, working group one on small and medium entities. There's one on international commercial arbitration. Uh, number three was on online dispute resolution, e-commerce, cross-border insolvency and secure transactions. But as I said, these working groups keep on changing frequently depending upon the tasks that have been assigned by the commission that meets once a year in the summer, um, alternatively in uh, Vienna and in New York. Um, on Citral's mandate, as was set up in the initial uh, resolutions through which it was created, is basically to create legal standards. Initially, it was most, mostly associated, the mandate, with the coordination of uh, the work of different harmonization bodies in commercial law around the world, including, for instance, UNIDWA, including uh, the Hague Conference of Private International Law. And now there's another number of different institutions that work specifically in the field of harmonization of commercial law. But now, today, the main role of Oncitral is to set up legal standards, standards that can be followed by different countries in the world in order to update uh, their legislations, to put them uh, uh, basically in harmony with the best practices that exist in, in most of the countries. Oncitral does not have uh, an army, does not have any coercive powers to impose any of its decisions or its legal or non-legal instruments. So basically what it does is it prepares a number of um, um, model laws, legislative guides, and other instruments that are suggested, that are proposed to the countries in order to update or to modernize uh, commercial law. So uh, today, I think uh, Oncitral is mostly interested in the modernization of the internal legislation of each of the member states, even more than in the harmonization of commercial law. And of course, the, the, the reason for that is that the effectiveness of international uh, rules depend mostly on the quality of each state internal rules. And when we talk about the quality of internal rules, we're not only referring uh, to the substantive regulations that exist in codes and statutes, but we also talk about enforcement and the institutional infrastructure that the countries have. So Oncitral is very interested not only in seeing countries implementing the different uh, products that it creates, 
but also in seeing in practice how they work, uh, how they are enforced, how, uh, how they are developed. In fact, Oncitral has the, the very famous cloud system, which is a compilation of different decisions that are rendered by countries that have adopted the instruments of Oncitral. And this is a repository of uh, decisions, judicial or administrative decisions that uh, talk about instruments that Oncitral have, uh, has created in the past. Um, now, most of the proposed Oncitral models are soft law. Uh, basically, they are intended for the countries to uh, have like a guiding principle that they can take um, into account when preparing their own legislations. So in other words, Oncitral helps uh, countries to produce their own internal legislations uh, through um, this um, kind of an international parliament that has been created in Vienna and in New York that is formed of this multicultural, multinational sort of jurists coming from different countries of the world pertaining to different traditions, including, of course, uh, the um, common law, the civil law, the Muslim uh, type of tradition. Um, and basically in this forum, all these ideas are discussed and the best practices normally uh, subside and end up being prevalent in the instruments that are prepared by Oncitral. There are conventions, which are probably the most uh, easily enforceable sort of instruments that are created by Oncitral, like the very famous one on the international sales of goods. There are legislative guides, which are basically uh, principles that are used in order for legislators to um, enact uh, certain statutes or certain acts or certain legislations that have to do with the work of Oncitral. There are model laws and there are also model clauses and other recommendations that are rendered by the uh, secretariat and by the commission itself. Um, now, uh, model laws, which is, is the, the, the ones that we're going to be discussing during this brief presentation, are basically non-binding legislative texts. As I have said uh, uh, many times, these texts are not intended to be mandatory. There are principles that can be adopted by the countries. And of course, one of the topics that uh, we will discuss further on is that uh, the closer the state uh, follows the rules or the principles that are encompassed in the model laws, the better the legis legislation will be. And in fact, one of the problems that exists concerning this type of legislative techniques is that when the, the model laws are not duly implemented or not completely implemented, many gaps may appear and many difficulties in its application may also ensue. So basically, the adoption, the, the full adoption of these model laws as internal le legislation is what is recommended in order for the modernization of the legal system. And in fact, uh, and this is a topic that must be uh, said, particularly for one who has participated actively in many of the working groups and even in the commission, is that the Oncitral work is mostly addressed to developing nations and to emerging economies. Because of course, those are the ones that are uh, that, that need this technical input that the commission can provide. Mostly uh, the develop, develop, most developed countries, despite the fact that in many cases they adopt model laws, they already have in place very sophisticated, avant-garde, uh, progressive, further looking legislations that normally um, don't need to be updated. But the Oncitral Commission, the Oncitral work is basically, basically focused these days in helping uh, developing nations, emerging economies, in creating standards and legal uh, rules that can be actually functional in terms of the best practices that are normally encompassed in these instruments adopted by uh, the Commission. So here are some of the instruments in the, in the field of insolvency that the commission has enacted or has prepared better 
uh, during several uh, different years. And we have here model laws. We have three different model laws. One, which is the most recent one adopted last year, the Enterprise Group Insolvency Model Law of 2019. Then we have another one, which is the recognition of insolvency related judgments and the cross border insolvency model law, uh, which is the one that we're going to be speaking of. And then there's also a legislative guide that was uh, produced or prepared by the commission in 2004, which is um, uh, a very useful also tool for legislators that want to develop their own internal insolvency uh, regulations. And there's also a number of explanatory texts, including uh, first the judicial perspective on the model law on cross-border insolvency and the practice guide on cross-border insolvency. So as you can see, the activity of this working group has been extremely prolific in terms of preparing and producing important pieces of legislation that can be adopted by the different countries, not to mention what I already uh, referred to, which is the cloud, which is, as I said before, a repository of important judicial and administrative decisions rendered by the different uh, countries uh, that have adopted instruments in this field of cross-border insolvency. Now let's, let's, well, what is it when we talk about cross-border insolvency? And as I said before, since this is a primer, uh, let us discuss very briefly what we mean when we talk about cross-border insolvency. And it basically relates uh, to a number of regulations, legal rules, substantive regulations, basically, that are applicable to debtors that are undergoing uh, financial distress, financial difficulties, but this specific type of debtors have a particular sort of feature, and is that they have assets or creditors in different countries, not only in the host country, not only where they have their main operations, but they have also assets and creditors in different parts of the world. So in, in, that, in that sense, um, cross-border insolvency is uh, different to um, local or domestic insolvency, which of course relates to debtors in financial distress that only have assets or creditors or that most of the assets and creditors are located within the um, host country. And it, having said that, it is obvious that this, this type of, 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 of legislation, this type of cross-border insolvency is mostly applicable to <clears throat> medium to large corporations, normally micro or small businesses uh, they normally are okay by undergoing uh, processes in their, in their uh, own countries and they don't need to abide to this type of uh, cross-border sort of regulations, multinational regulations. Now, of course, there's a number of difficulties for a company that has this type of situation that has debtors or creditors in different parts of the world. First of all, of course, and given the pandemic, as Isham had the opportunity to mention in the introduction that he made, uh, the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19, has created a large number of bankruptcies and insolvency proceedings and situations uh, spreading across uh, the globe. Uh, particularly, you can see that in the touristic sector, in the airline sector, in the hotel. Uh, sector in which, of course, all these companies are seeing their cash flows significantly reduced and, of course, um, the paralysis of their activities have caused them to file for uh, this type of cross-border insolvency proceedings. And, of course, when we talk about these large corporations or, uh, for instance, airlines that have assets and creditors in different countries, it is critically important that they can centralize the proceeding in a single forum so that uh, all these claims that are filed can be basically submitted uh, to a single forum and therefore the process can be coordinated and harmonized in a reasonable manner. 
Normally, and this is also a thing that has to be taken into account, the costs associated to this type of proceedings are very high, not only um, in terms of the fees that seem to be very expensive, but also in terms of the time that is spent in the proceedings. In many cases, particularly in those countries that have not adopted this type of cross-border insolvency instruments, it is very difficult to get the decisions enforced by local courts normally requiring uh, proceedings of international private law, such as exequator and other forms of uh, recognizing foreign judgments and decisions rendered by bankruptcy courts from other parts of the world. Um, I have heard recently that one of these processes can easily, for instance, for a medium airline can be, can be uh, costing uh, amounts close to $10 million. So we're talking here about very serious numbers in terms of the expenses that have to be assumed. And of course, um, another difficulty is to define the situation of secured and insecure creditors. Those jurisdictions that have adopted rules on secure transactions normally uh, have uh, proceedings that exclude uh, secured creditors from the process and therefore they can self-execute their um, collateral uh, goods that have been given by the debtors, which makes it even more difficult for the company to survive within a reorganization process. So the, all these things have to be taken into account, including also the reciprocity and cooperation that in the absence of this cross-border insolvency um, regulations are difficult to achieve. It is normally difficult to uh, get this type of uh, cooperation uh, among uh, courts and tribunals when you don't have an instrument that provides for an easy coordination of the processes. So as I said before, uh, many principles of private international law may end up being a difficulty, an additional challenge that is added to the difficulties of the process when you don't have cross-border insolvency, like the rules concerning the choice of law, uh, rules concerning jurisdiction, and rules concerning enforcement of foreign judgments. Also, um, take into account that formalistic requirements may give rise uh, to delays and also to a high level of unpredictability particularly countries with, uh, which have um, a weak um, infrastructure, institutional infrastructure, have not adopted this type of instruments, uh, normally are characterized by proceedings that are uh, time consuming. Uh, so protracted lit litigation can take place and the expenses of the process may end up being very high. And then let's look at the different schools of thought how uh, cross-border insolvency is handled or dealt with in different countries of the world. So we start off with the most widespread approach. Incredibly enough, this is what happens in most countries of the world. In fact, as we will see uh, further on, um, the uh, Ancitral Model Law has only been adopted in 47 countries of the world. So basically the territorial approach is the most uh, common sort of approach in terms of these, these type of proceedings. And it means basically that each country exercises complete sovereignty. Uh, so its domestic, uh, its own domestic insolvency laws are applicable to all of the debtors' properties <clears throat> and to all of the creditors that are located with or outside its own, within or outside of, of its own jurisdiction. So basically there's no extraterritorial approach to insolvent, insolvency laws. And therefore, if you want to get your claim recognized and you're a foreign creditor, you will be subject to a number of difficulties, including but not limited to the situation that you are not even summoned because normally the courts are not uh, obliged to summon uh, foreign creditors. And therefore, in order to get your rights protected, you will need to retain local counsel and normally appear before the court in the country where 
the bankruptcy process is taking place. And by the same token, the debtor will have difficulties enforcing the relief that has been granted by the domestic court. In other words, if for instance, an automatic stay uh, takes place right after the petition has been uh, admitted and the company has been uh, subject to relief, such automatic stay will probably not be enforceable outside of the boundaries of the country in which the domestic insolvency process is taking place. So of course, this makes it extra difficult for the debtor to protect assets or properties that are located outside of uh, its own jurisdiction. Um, so as I said before, this is a very common sort of approach. Many countries have not, uh, in many important countries, we were talking before uh, the commencement of this brief uh, presentation with Isham, that for instance, uh, such an important country as India has not adopted yet the uh, model law on cross-border insolvency. And it would be very useful uh, for the large corporations of India to um, have this instrument at hand in the event of cross-border insolvency. Okay, so in the territorial approach, just to wrap up a little bit and summarize what I've said before, um, the applicable laws are basically the local laws, unless you can abide to principles of private international law uh, that would allow you to get uh, exequator and recognition through very complicated, uh, for instance, letters, rogatory, and all these uh, kind of anachronistic proceedings that exist in private international law that take a long time and may not be suitable when the situation uh, is, is very urgent and requires expeditious sort of actions in, in, from the part of, of the uh, institutions that participate in the process. The creditors uh, need to seek for assets in several jurisdictions, but of course all these assets will be subject to foreclosure because no automatic stay will be in place and therefore foreign creditors may end up acting opportunistically and trying to um, execute and foreclose on those assets that are located outside of the main or the, or the, the bankruptcy form where the process is taking place. As I said before, the creditors may not be properly summoned when you're a foreigner, and therefore you will not even probably find out that the company has entered into this type of proceeding. So they may not even be aware of the process. And of course, this creates a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability for the different parties and stakeholders that participate in this type of process. As, as I said before, opportunistic behavior may ensue. The creditors um, may have an incentive to collect if they are outside uh, the domestic forum where the bankruptcy is being handled. And uh, despite the fact that they have or not a legal priority, they may be able to uh, foreclose, to collect uh, on, on their assets that they have, uh, they, that the company that the debtor has abroad. And of course also the debtor by the same token and looking at the problem from the other perspective, the debtor also may take advantage opportunistically of a lack of international coordination um, to, um, for instance, not, not informing foreign creditors about the situation and then imposing upon them the uh, reorganization plan without uh, counting uh, with their uh, consent or their participation in the uh, process. So, of course, these are difficulties, disadvantages that arise from the uh, territorial approach, okay? Of course, the transaction costs go up, the coordination is difficult, uh, the need to act in different jurisdictions makes it, makes it extremely expensive, both for creditors and debtors, and of course, this may end up, uh, this may result in a value destruction in terms of the assets of uh, the debtor for the creditors. Now, a second type of uh, school of thought, which uh, seems to be a little bit utopic or idealist, is the so-called universal or universalist, if you like, approach in which any cross-border insolvency 
is administered pursuant to a single global insolvency regime. So basically, in this case, if we were to adopt this type of system, all the debtors' assets, assets would be to be distributed by a single insolvency office uh, uh, holder, regardless of the place where the assets or the claimants are located. So you have a single court, this single court controls the entire proceeding, and therefore there's no need to seek any additional uh, cooperation. This, in, this, um, in, in this case, the creditors are treated fairly and there's sufficient distribution between uh, the creditors. But of course, since it is very difficult to get a completely universalist approach, there are hybrid approaches as well. So when we talk here about something referred to as modified universalism, in which the individual countries identified relevant jurisdictions in which the proceedings may be conducted and such states cooperate and facilitate the proceedings subject to public policy proceedings or provisions. And then the cooperative territorialism in which you have a ter territorialist approach plus multilateral conventions in which the countries may enter. Now, one topic that is very significant and very important to take into account when you're dealing with cross-border insolvency, and this is a very basic tenet of this type of proceedings, is that you have to divide the processes into main proceedings and non-main proceedings. Uh, well, what does that mean? The debtor normally has a so-called kami which is the center of main interests. And it, where the center of main interest of the debtor uh, is located, you will have to have a main proceeding. In any other place in which the debtor may have any commercial establishment or activity would be referred to as a non-main proceeding. So when you talk about the kami, and this is one of the subjects that gives uh, rise to more difficulties in terms of construction of uh, these type of ideas, and is how do we determine the kami? How do we determine the center of main interest, which is relevant, as I said, to define the, the court in which the main proceeding will take place? One of the, the, the most important uh, criteria uh, that is that are used in order to define the kami is the place of the debtor's registration. And in fact, this is the default provision on the under the UNCITRAL model law on cross-border insolvency. So it is a very easy and simple criterion which defines the center of main interest of the debtor as a default provision uh, where that debtor uh, if it's a corporation or any other legal entity where that entity is registered, where the commercial or the corporate or the business registry has taken place. But of course, this is a presumption that can be rebutted. This presumption may uh, easily, through evidence, be rebutted and therefore uh, the debtor can prove that despite the fact that the corporation has been registered in a certain country, its kami, its center of, of main interest is located elsewhere. For instance, in many cases, the headquarters are located in a different place uh, as compared to the place in which uh, the debtor has been registered. The place that has been set for dispute resolution, the place where the main creditors are located. Many companies, for instance, have mostly international credits and I'm, I'm talking here again about for instance airlines outside of the u.s that normally have a number of creditors with uh domiciled in the u.s or in europe or in asia for instance the lessors the suppliers of uh, fuel uh, of services of catering many of these creditors are located these vendors are located outside of the debtor's registration place, and therefore the kami may be displaced 
to those countries in which the main creditors or the main amount of credits are located. Also, the place where the board meets uh, is also a, a significant criteria. But then again, and let me wrap up and insist on this important um, difference between main proceedings and non-main proceedings, uh, and also take into account that the criterion to define where the main proceeding should take place is the commie or the center of main interest. And this is a decision that is initially made by the corporation, by the debtor that is insolvent, but will be defined by the court where the petition has been filed. For instance, you can file in the Southern District of New York, which is a, a very common form for uh, bankruptcies of airlines because it has a lot of experience in international uh, matters. And the court may disregard your filing, may dismiss it on the grounds that the company doesn't have any activity or any significant creditors in the US. So it is up to the court, it is up to the tribunal, the bankruptcy tribunal, to define whether the Kami has been properly selected or not. But of course, the original choice is made directly by the debtor, by the corporation that does the filing. Now, let's move on and let's switch to the uh, model law on cross-border insolvency, which was approved initially on May 30th of 1997. And there's also, of course, a guide for its enactment and interpretation, which was approved by the commission in 2013. What the model law does is to regulate the treatment of uh, debtors under financial distress that have assets or creditors in more than one country, which is again, the uh, criterion that we have insistent, insisted in uh, during the entire presentation. Now, 47 countries around the globe have adopted the model law on cross-border insolvency. And there's a caveat to this, this, um, this assertion. And basically, um, we must say that not necessarily all the 47 countries that are said to have adopted the model law uh, have included all the principles or all the uh, articles or all the provisions that are contained in the model law. Because as I said before, then we have to understand that the model laws are not binding instruments, are not mandatory instruments, and therefore countries are free, legislators are free to define what is included and what is not included in the domestic legislations. This is a very important topic because countries that have adopted the model law may have very different takes on different topics uh, within the law. And this may create, of course, difficulties because those, those differences may depend upon the very manner in which the domestic insolvency laws are crafted, the very manner in which the institutional infrastructure of the country works and the very manner in which the judiciary, particularly the bankruptcy judiciary, judiciary is a structure which has to do also with rules on civil procedure that tend to vary to a great extent uh, um, between one jurisdiction and another. So those are topics that need to be taken into account in order uh, to, um, to consider what is to be uh, a, a full adoption of the model law. And of course, as I said before, and I will insist and reiterate that, that principle, it is much better if the country decides to adopt the entire, the entire articles that are proposed by the commission, uh, not to make uh, many exclusions, not to make many uh, changes or um, exceptions to what is uh, provided under the model law in order to make it more functional and more useful for the parties. Now let's look at some of the countries that have adopted the model law. Uh, and as you can see here, this has been a very, an extremely successful instrument, one of the most successful instruments of the Oncitral, despite the fact that uh, 47 countries may not sound to be uh, too many, it is an incredibly successful instrument of the United Nations Commission on, on International Trade Law. 
including the U United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, South Africa, Australia, Japan, and also emerging jurisdictions such as South Africa, such as Colombia, such as Mexico. And it's interesting because this provides a very interesting dialogue, and we will uh, talk a little bit about that uh, on, on further uh, extent, and is that um, it is very interesting to see the articulation that takes place in practice between very sophisticated, uh, developed jurisdictions, like the ones in the US and Canada, with jurisdictions that are weaker, that are less sophisticated, but that nonetheless, through this instrument, get to have a very active, and I would say, a very um, dynamic sort of dialogue, um, given the fact that they have both countries adopted the same sort of uh, substantive provisions. So I think, uh, adopting model laws has another impact, and it, it really upgrades not only the substantive laws, but also upgrades the operation and the enforcement and the implementation in practice of these laws when this uh, dialogue, when this uh, articulation, when this sort of interaction takes place between courts of very developed and underdeveloped nations or, or nations in in ways of development. Now, there's three different hypotheses for international uh, bankruptcy processes under the uh, cross-border insolvency uh, model law. The first one is when the debtor has assets in several countries. We already explained that. This is very common. And, and these assets may be bank accounts, for instance, maybe buildings, maybe um, goods, maybe uh, subsidiaries, and this is a, a good thing if, if you want to start off one of these processes, it is useful to have subsidiaries in different uh, countries because this activates uh, jurisdictions. Um, also, the second one is when the debtor has creditors outside of the main bankruptcy forum. And the third one is when uh, there have been uh, different insolvency proceedings admitted simultaneously in various countries of the world. So when you have these type of situations, any of these three situations, you will have a cross-border insolvency. Now, what are the basic principles uh, associated with the model law? The basic idea is that the states cooperate and they assist insolvency officials from other countries regarding main or non-main proceedings. And here we have a number of um, officers that are appointed within a bankruptcy proceeding that are court appointed officers, like for instance, liquidators, trustees, receivers, all these people are uh, insolvency administrators and they are given um, wide powers by their local courts to administer the assets and to undertake a number of proceedings related to the bankruptcy uh, process. So the idea uh, in this first principle is that the estates uh, provide kind of credit to these officers. They give them the uh, right, the ability to uh, undertake their uh, powers, their functions outside of the jurisdiction in which the bankruptcy process was filed. And this is a critically important matter because it really expedites the process and facilitates the interaction with foreign courts. The second principle would be that the states uh, should not give any preferences to domestic creditors vis-a-vis -vis foreign creditors. So this, we can call this principle a sort of non-discriminatory uh, principle, uh, which basically equates the rights of foreign and local creditors so that all of them have the same ability to participate in the process, to be summoned, to be treated fairly, to have the same priorities as they exist under the local regime, and of course to be summoned uh, timely uh, to the different hearings and the different proceedings that take place within uh, the bankruptcy process. They can vote, they can uh, file their proof of claim, uh, before the relevant authority. They can request um, to the court uh, different uh, petitions, uh, such as the dismissal of the case, 
such as the recognition of a creditor, such as the um, automatic stay concerning a certain uh, legal action that is uh, going on, and so on and so forth. So basically, the states should give a fair treatment, a, an equal treatment to local and foreign creditors. So it has several advantages. It really harmonizes the best practices. It, it facilitates the coordination of different proceedings, as we said before, and it uh, gives a fair treatment of parties. Now, one question that arises here is in whose favor is the model law designed? And we, when we talk about bankruptcy regulations, we normally talk about, uh, about two different uh, opposing concepts in either side of the spectrum or the continuum. One is debtor-friendly uh, legislations, and the second one is a creditor-friendly legislation. Um, how do we define the model law? And it would definitely dep depend upon the person th that, that provides the opinion. But my own personal opinion uh, would be that this, this model law is a balanced sort of uh, legislation because it, it gives many rights to the debtor uh, and it protects the debtor's uh, assets so as to facilitate the reorganization and the emergence of the company as a going concern. But also it's uh, in, a, in a manner creditor friendly because it gives every right to creditors to participate in the process and to make sure that their rights are fully recognized and honored during the entire uh, proceeding. So it's very interesting to see that um, uh, between those two sides of the spectrum, you have a model law that in my opinion, at least, is balanced. Some people think that this has been, this is a, an instrument that has been devised uh, by uh, um, very advanced economies to only to protect uh, their creditors, but I don't think so. I really believe that it, it's also a debtor-friendly sort of instrument that has been very beneficial also in emerging uh, jurisdictions um, that have uh, protected many of their companies um, by use of this uh, model law on um, cross-border insolvency. What are the purposes? And let me be, uh, let me reiterate: cooperation, protection of business as a going concern, legal certainty and predictability, uh, getting a higher value for the assets, and of course to provide for an efficient case management. What's the nature of the model law? This is another question that arises here and that is very important. Um, and basically, what we will say is that. Uh, it is not intended for the universal unification of insolvency laws. That is why this model law is being referred to as a unilateral law because it does not require reciprocity. In other words, you can apply the model law despite the fact that the uh, foreign jurisdiction uh, does not or has not adopted the model law. Of course, as all of the instruments of the ANSI trial it has an international origin and therefore uh, you can expect to have a, a uniform interpretation under international principles. So basically you have to um, somehow uh, leave the, the parochial, the local sort of approach for the interpretation of the law and move on to a more sort of um, international approach in the interpretation of, the, of this type of, of, of laws. Now, what cases are uh, the ones to which the model law on cross-border insolvency is applied? So you have processes that are reorganization processes, of course, those that are intended to uh, maintain the business as a going concern, or liquidation processes, irrespective of the name that is given, uh, to it in, in each of the local uh, legislations. But when we talk about liquidation, we're talking about, of course, the winding up of the affairs and the assets 
of the corporation and the final extinction of the legal entity. It has to be a collective process. And when, when we talk about collective process, we're talking not about an executory or a collective action that is undertaken by an individual, but you need to have several creditors that are interested in collecting uh, their um, claims uh, within that single forum. So it has to be a multiple number of uh, creditors in order to, um, to get the, to the application of the, of the model law. And again, the business and assets of the debtor must be subject to some sort of court supervision. So some kind of uh, bankruptcy process, insolvency process, or reorganization, liquidation, winding up process must have, uh, have been opened by some uh, court or some uh, agency or some institution. So it is not like a private liquidation that is undertaken directly by the shareholders uh, of a corporation that is subject to this type of regulations. You need to have a process in place in order to activate the provisions of the model law. Now there are, there are two types of application. One, we can call it inbound application, in which the petition is filed by a foreign court before one of the enacting states, or outbound application, which is exactly the opposite. That is to say that the petition is filed by the enacting state court before a foreign court. What are the features? And let, let, let me mention them very briefly. Uh, these are probably the most useful ones. The first one is the easy access to the court. So the foreign representatives, and I, I can tell you I have seen it in practice because when I was a governmental officer, we appointed a foreign representative in a bankruptcy process. And this guy basically flew to the US and under chapter 15 of the American Bankruptcy Code, he could file a petition for recognition and the court immediately granted this type of recognition uh, to our representative. So it really facilitates this type of recognition. Also, of course, this foreign representative petitions the recognition of the foreign proceeding. And then, of course, the, the foreign representative requests relief. Uh, there's even an interim relief before the recognition has taken place that allows for an automatic stay that may take a few weeks uh, before the process is fully recognized. And then after the process has been fully recognized by the court, then the automatic stay ensues. So the complete relief is granted uh, in a manner in which the assets are protected and then collection processes against the debtor are uh, stopped. They come to a halt and therefore um, they, ca they cannot continue uh, and they are basically accumulated or they are consolidated under the same uh, insolvency process. And of course, there's cooperation among courts and I've seen also uh, direct communication between judges uh, and between uh, the, the courts and the foreign representatives as well which of course makes it much easier to handle the proceeding, not necessarily through the legal, the foreign representative, but directly between the judges, between the courts that are handling the proceeding. Now let me, let me move on to, to complete the, the presentation um, to what would be a specific case or a specific example in the uh, context of an international bankruptcy or a cross-border insolvency. For instance, if you have an airline, the most important thing is to prevent the lessors and other creditors from repossessing critical assets or the equipment that the airline has. For instance, um, normally in lease contracts, uh, you have a clause, those are net leases in which um, once the plane lands in any airport, the uh, lessor is entitled to repossess the aircraft and, and they do it in a very uh, conspicuous manner. 
basically they send the pilot, that pilot has another key or another access to the plane, and the pilot basically requests authorization uh, from the airport to uh, take off, and basically uh, that pilot takes the plane back to the Lesor's uh, headquarters or fields, uh, and the, the, the airline is deprived of its main asset. So of course, that's one of the fears when you have an airline under distress and you are in default in the payment of leases, normally you would like to protect your fleet and therefore through this process, you can request the cooperation of the foreign court to um, basically uh, grant relief and therefore um, prevent Lessors from repossessing the aircraft. Also, you can make some arrangements before the court, and there's the so-called first day motions in which, for instance, that small vendors can be authorized to be paid. So you have uh, workers, you have uh, catering vendors, you have um, uh, fees, governmental fees that have to be paid, uh, some taxes maybe, so the court may authorize you to do that. Another advantage, executory contracts can be terminated uh, through court authorization. So in many cases, an airline, for instance, doesn't need as many planes as it has. And despite the fact that the lease contracts have been um, contracted for a long time, long term, let's say 10 years, 20 years, you can terminate the, 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 these contracts without having to pay the entire compensation that normally would ensue for unilateral termination of a contract. So through the theory of mitigation of damages, then the compensation that has to be paid to the lessor is much uh, lower than it would be if you had to terminate it unilaterally um, by, by yourself. So this is also a very important and significant exception. And also the credit that remains to the lessor will form part of the reorganization plan. So it will be negotiated within the terms and conditions of the plan. The negotiation, of course, is very important because it allows you to take, uh, for instance, the leases and other expenses that airlines have to pay to current market values. Um, it happened, for instance, in 9-11, where the leases went down, but some airlines had uh, long-term leases already in place, they were able to renegotiate the prices, the fees that they had to pay to the source to uh, market values that existed post 9-11 and in that manner getting a very significant uh, relief in their financial situation. And fine, and another one would be that operators are bound by the approved uh, reorganization plan. This is probably one of the most significant advantages, not only in the local jurisdiction, but also in any other country in which uh, the debtor has operations. And last but not least, um, there's the so-called deep financing or debtor in possession financing, which basically means that any creditor that grants um, loans to the insolvent corporation has a priority for the payment of those loans, provided that the loans were given after the uh, company was admitted into the process. So any post-bankruptcy sort of loan uh, must be paid with uh, a priority over the other uh, credits that the uh, bankrupted corporation may have. And this is a great advantage because normally uh, corporations that are under distress find it very hard to uh, get uh, credit uh, because they are not uh, maybe trustworthy uh, for uh, banks and other financial institutions. But this type of priority that is uh, given through the deep financing, of course, provides a very significant opportunity for additional resources for the insolvent uh, corporation. Having said that, I think we have covered the basic um, topics that surround not only the model law, but the situations that ensue and, and take place when an international bankruptcy uh, 
uh, takes place. So um, uh, I would like to end by thanking Isham once again and Chris uh, for this wonderful opportunity and also thanking all the people in the audience uh, for being with us. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Via Mirza. It was, it was a masterclass in cross-border insolvency and uh, we have a plethora of questions and I, I'm sure it will be difficult to cover all of those questions, but what we can do is consolidate some of the questions so that uh, the attendees can have their answers and we have already crossed 12.30 p.m. Eastern time, so I would request the attendees to stay on so we can have a round of question and answers with Dr. Via Mitsar briefly. Uh, one of the things that is uh, that I can see emanating from the questions is about the reciprocity requirement, how it works, what happens if another country does not cooperate in the acquisition of the property or the recovery of the property to cover for debts, what happens in those scenarios? Well, actually the, the model laws, as I said before, does not require reciprocity in order to operate. So it may happen that the uh, country in which the bankruptcy has been uh, filed uh, has adopted the model law, but the country in which it is requesting cooperation has not adopted the model law. So the, the, the first country may use all the provisions included in the ancestral model law and then we'll expect uh, the other country to help, to cooperate. But it, of course, this would be a very contingent sort of situation. So the ideal situation, which I have seen in practice, is when both the requesting country and the recipient country, both of them have adopted uh, the model law. So in that case, and the important thing to consider here is that if the countries have adopted the model law, what it means basically is that the model law becomes domestic legislation. It, it, it forms part of their own uh, legal system. For instance, in the US, um, the model law has been incorporated in a separate chapter of the Federal Bankruptcy Code, which is uh, chapter 15. Therefore, um, therefore, once a petition is filed for cross-border insolvency, all these rules that are included in chapter 15 will be applicable and the court will not have discretion as to apply them or not. It will be bound to apply them because it's the federal law that mandates such regulations to proceed accordingly. Whereas if the, uh, the foreign country has not adopted the model law, it will be more difficult to convince that foreign country to enforce an automatic stay or to uh, grant relief or to recognize the foreign proceeding or to give uh, powers to the foreign representative. And in many cases, as I explained, this will become a real conundrum because it will be subject to the rules of private international law, which of course are not necessarily the simplest, the easiest ones. Uh, another question is that, what is the risk that countries with different criteria for prioritizing creditors affect the rights of those creditors? So to speak that, what is the basis of treating creditors fairly and equitably? And what are the basis of classification? Well, basically, basically credits normally, uh, according to any insolvency regimes, are, are subject to an, an absolute priority rule. Everybody is treated without any discrimination. Uh, you don't collect, uh, depending on the moment in which the credit was uh, um, acquired, but basically upon the, the class of credit that you have. Normally, the, the main classification which is the one, for instance, that is used um, in the U.S., divides credits in secured and non-secured creditors. But it, you, you can see more and more in developing uh, jurisdictions, particularly, that there's more extensive and more complex taxonomies of creditors. And for instance, there are priorities that are granted uh, for uh, workers, uh, for pensioners, 
for um, um, municipalities, uh, revenues uh, for taxes, um, secure uh, transactions that have taken place. So it will depend very much upon the substantive bankruptcy uh, regime of each country. Uh, as I said, the Uncitral Model Law does not prepare to um, interfere or to change the internal uh, bankruptcy rules is mostly an instrument of cooperation, coordination, and uh, procedural harmo international harmonization. But it's not intended to change the way in which each jurisdiction handles the bankruptcy process. And of course, this question is critically important because you need to look in each jurisdiction, what would be your ranking when you file your claim? For instance, if you file your claim in Argentina or Brazil in Colombia, and you are a labor creditor, you definitely will have a priority that uh, may even go uh, beyond those that are granted to secure creditors. So uh, of course, you, you need to navigate a very complex sort of array of uh, legislations in order to understand how this works in practice. And of course, the aid of local council is always a very important thing uh, to take into account. Thank you. Uh, very, uh, one very pandemic specific question is that, will the pandemic have adverse impact on the resolutions of insolvency? As you know, liquidity has been affected across the world. So there has to be a likelihood that there is less adequate number of acquirers or resolution applicants in the market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the pandemic has created a wave of insolvency reforms all over the world. So you've seen uh, situations in Singapore, in Spain, in Latin America, in different parts of the world in which uh, the pandemic has forced the government and the legislators alike to uh, introduce many changes to the legislation in order to facilitate the access to the process to remove formalities and cumbersome proceedings that existed in order to uh, allow for um, debtors uh, that are undergoing uh, complicated situations to have access to this bankruptcy forum. So uh, yes, uh, I think um, there's, there's been also a number of initiatives to facilitate financing. Governments have also allocated significant resources to help uh, for the uh, reorganization of corporations under this stress. Um, but of course, again, you need to look at each jurisdiction in order, in order to um, uh, review what's going on. And by the way, um, the UNCITRAL working groups are not operating at this time. The commission has basically stopped its sessions uh, waiting uh, for uh, a resolution to this entire situation. So the works that have been uh, carried out in the different working groups have come to a halt now and we're waiting for what's going to happen next year. But this year, I don't see that there will be any sessions taking place either in Vienna or in New York. Okay. Uh, another question is that how are debtors assets distributed by the office holder on a transnational scale? Yeah, of course, the, the, uh, the distribution of assets depends very much upon the, um, the local uh, regulation on insolvency, which is, of course, uh, basically linked to the credit priorities that exist in each uh, jurisdiction. And I think the example that was provided before helps to understand uh, what I'm trying to explain. Uh, for instance, if you are in one of those Latin American jurisdictions in which labor uh, rights are protected to a large extent, then the, if, if there's only a few assets, those assets will be allocated basically to those uh, labor uh, creditors, those workers or pensioners that have filed claims 
before the bankruptcy process. Other jurisdictions, like the one in the US, don't provide that much uh, in the way of protection to uh, labor creditors, and therefore is more focused, the US, for instance, in the distinction between secured and unsecured creditors, being the secured creditors more uh, protected than the unsecured ones. Um, so again, you need to look at the local substantive, and I would say private law or civil law provisions that relate to these taxonomies of creditors and that classify the different priorities in order to define how the assets would be allocated. This is not for the uh, model law to define, it's mostly for the local uh, legislation, provided of course that there's a fair treatment and that there's no discrimination between uh, foreign and local creditors. So uh, that's, that's the main idea uh, that underlies, as we said, the uh, model law is to prevent or avoid any type of discrimination to, low, to foreign creditors and therefore treat them equally, but treat them equally under the laws of the main forum, which is, are the ones that are going to be applicable to the process. Remember that once we have defined the COMI, the center of main interest, the uh, jurisdiction will have full powers to undertake the entire process and the applicable rules would be the rules that exist under that jurisdiction, okay? Great, fantastic, fantastic. I see that uh, we've overshot the time of the webinar by 15 minutes, and it may not be possible to take all of the questions together, but what we can do is that we will send up a follow-up follow email to all of you, and we would request you all to please share any questions that you may have and we may then later in time consult with the dr we amit Zar to provide more clarity on that but thank you so much everyone for being a fantastic audience and for being such fantastic uh, attendees who asked amazing questions and we will try to cover all those questions maybe in a follow-up session we'll also try to provide a recording of this uh, webinar but most importantly thank you thank you thank you very much to Professor Dr. Via Mizar for such an insightful session. And we look forward to seeing you all on our next webinar, which we'll announce soon. Thank you so much, everyone. I think it was a great last time. thing. Um, last uh, thing, Isham. Um, anyone that would like to can contact me through LinkedIn or Facebook or any of the, or the, or the social networks. I'll be happy to um, talk to you and answer any questions that you may have and that are within my domain. Thank you so much for the wonderful invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francisco, very much. That was uh, a wonderful presentation, uh, very powerful. Thank you.